So it's now time for member statements. The member from Perth Wellington. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a community, we believe in extending compassion to those who most need it. That's why end-of-life care for all ages and stages is essential. That's why we've seen a groundswell of support for a new residential hospice in Perth County. And that's why I strongly support the efforts of the Stratford Perth Residential Hospice Committee. Since 2013, they have been working tirelessly. They have been working to pursue the approvals and funding they need from the Southwest Lynn. They've done their homework. They have engaged partners in and across Perth County and then in Huron County. In recent months, I met with several times with committee members Andy Werner and Ann Fontana. The community is fortunate to have their leadership on a project this important. Many times I've expressed public support for this project, and recently I wrote directly to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I reminded him that the government has already committed $75 million in funding for hospices and end-of-life care. I also noted that his government recently committed to fund new palliative care beds in other communities. But now we need him to come through for our community. We need him to include Perth County in the first round of funding for the new hospice beds for underserviced areas. If he does that, we'll be the first to applaud. It's time to move on this project. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, today I want to take a moment to remind everyone that September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. While we have made much progress when it comes to fighting childhood cancer, we still have far too many families having to wage courageous battles against this horrible disease, and sadly, too many parents have to lay their children to rest in the province of Ontario. Unfortunately, cancer remains the number one disease-related cause of children, uh, de cause of death uh, of children ages zero to 14 in Canada. Over the last year, Speaker, my hometown of Bell River, Bell River was touched and inspired uh, by another little superhero. Mason Macri was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. Mason was a huge fan of superheroes, and a wonderful photo of Mason in his Batman shirt and cape was featured in local media. His bravery and his fight against cancer inspired people across our community and indeed across our country. Uh, Mason was even honoured by Don Cherry and Ron McLean on Hockey Night in Canada. Sadly, Speaker, this past June, Mason passed. The legacy he leaves us is one that inspires us all to keep the fight uh, in his name and in the name of so many young people who have taught us what true bravery, bravery really means. Mason Macri received a superhero send-off back home as many people in our community lined the streets dressed as superheroes to say a final goodbye. The Canadian Snowbirds uh, forces did a flyover uh, to honour Mason, and I stand here today to do my part to honour him as well as remind us all that the fight continues and to pledge that we won't give up until every child has the ability to say that they beat cancer. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. For the member of statements, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm here today to pay tribute to all the incredible volunteers who belong to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of Canada. And they're here today, and that's why we're all wearing the red carnations. Uh, in Canada, we have, sadly, Mr. Speaker, the highest rate of MS in the world. Over 100,000 Canadians are afflicted with MS. And in Ontario, there's about 37,000 people are living with this disease. I encourage my fellow members and citizens across Ontario to advocate for income and employment support systems, which will ensure that those affected by MS will get the help they need as soon as they need it, for quality and coordinated health care is also an integral part in ensuring that those living with MS and their loved ones can continue to live healthy, independent, and fulfilling lives. Today, we have joined the fight here in the legislature. But as you know, Mr. Speaker, in all of our communities, there are friends, relatives, and neighbors that are fighting MS. And the good news is that there are so many fantastic volunteers who are helping to raise money and to help those with MS. So I salute everyone involved in fighting MS. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, on September 12th, the very first day the House resumed following the government's decision to prorogue the legislature, I tabled six resolutions. 
One of my resolutions, in fact, it's the very first item on the Legislature's order paper, calls on the Minister of Transportation to prioritize the Highway 7 Acton Bypass project by placing it on the Ministry's five-year plan for new highway construction. The Mayor of the Town of Halton Hills, Rick Bennett, Town Council and staff have asked the Minister to partner with the Town on a study to investigate alternatives for a long-term transportation solution for truck traffic along Highway 7 within the Town of Halton Hills. This would include reviewing the idea for an Acton bypass. I agree, it's a good idea. Working together, we have said that a bypass is needed to, in order to find a long-term solution to the problem of truck traffic along Highway 7. There are also local concerns about tra truck traffic through Georgetown and Norville, which needs to, need to be studied and addressed. I have raised this issue in the Legislature several times, also written to the Minister of Transportation many times, and talked to him directly. Last January, I initiated and helped arrange a meeting with the Minister and Mayor Bennett, Regional Chair Gary Carr, and Town Staff in the boardroom of the Minister's Queen's Park office. The Minister led us to believe he would try to help. On June the 8th, he indicated in writing that Ministry staff would assist with the terms of reference of the study. Now the Ministry needs to become a financial partner as well. The region of Halton is only continuing to grow, and this problem will continue to get worse unless we get together to find a long-term solution. Let's get going. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I rise today to honour London West constituent and Western University nursing professor Abe Udshorn, this year's recipient of the Western Humanitarian Award. This $5,000 annual award recognizes Western faculty, staff and students who are working to improve quality of life for people and communities around the world, with the funds directed to the support of humanitarian efforts. As the 2016 recipient, Abe is donating his $5,000 award to to the local agency All Our Sisters to help bring women with lived experience of homelessness to the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness Conference, which is being held in London this November. Speaker, I offer my profound thanks and congratulations to Western, to Abe Uchorn, and to All Our Sisters. First, to Western University for having the foresight and the vision to harness the passion for change and the dedication of faculty, staff, and students to building a fairer, more just society. Second, to for his leadership as chair of the London Homeless Coalition and for his unwavering commitment to putting knowledge into action. He is an inspiration to his students and to Londoners, showing what can be achieved when communities come together to tackle the complex health and social challenges of our time. Finally, to all our sisters, for empowering women who have survived homelessness to become part of the solution, to share knowledge, expertise and, and ideas that will help others out of marginalization and into stable housing. You are all heroes, and we salute you all. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. For the member of Phoenix, the member from Davenport. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to pay tribute to Antonio Souza, a true Portuguese pioneer and a role model to all Portuguese Canadians. As the MPP for the riding of Davenport, the riding with the largest population of Portuguese Canadians in Ontario and perhaps in Canada, and as a proud member of the Portuguese community, I was fortunate to have known Mr. Souza and his, see his dedication to his community and to the community that welcomed him and his family. Antonio Souza was a pioneer in the truest sense of the word. In 1953, Antonio left the oppressive regime in Portugal to start a new life in Canada and was one of the first Portuguese to immigrate to Canada. A year later, his wife, Maria Antonia, and their son, Julio, were reunited with him in Toronto. Their son, Charles, the Ontario Minister of Finance, was born a few years later. In Toronto, Antonio founded a restaurant and a boarding house in Kensington Market, where he became the heart of the community. He worked tirelessly helping others that immigrated to Canada start a new life in their new country by providing them with shelter, warm meals and a network to find employment. His early involvement in the community and his work with newcomers paved the way for the Portuguese community today. A passionate member of his community, Antonio Souza co-founded the first Portuguese Canadian Culture Centre, now in my riding of Davenport, and the Rancho Folclorico de Nazaré, and he was a big supporter of many other Luso-Canadian associations. Sadly, a month ago today, on August 29, 2016, Antonio Souza passed away peacefully. 
At the beautiful service to celebrate his life, Minister Souza mentioned that on his father's 50th anniversary in Canada, when asked what advice had he for the growing Portuguese community, Antonio stated, something I learned in life and always tried to convey in my own way to many people, but especially to my children and now my grandchildren. Always do your best and always try to give generously to others which you would like to receive. We are all truly grateful for Antonio's generosity, hard work, and dedication to his community. He will surely be missed, and I know that his work and his legacy will live across the province as a true Portuguese pioneer. Obrigado, Sr. Souza. Valeu a pena. Thank you. Through the member statements. The member from Foreign Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very happy that I have the students here from Nitivot Hatora Day School in Thorn Hill so that I can speak about Rosh Hashanah. Not everybody here knows exactly what Rosh Hashanah is all about, so I'm going to start off by saying that this year in the Jewish calendar, it is the year 5,776 since the Jewish community began counting the years. Now, Rosh Hashanah is mean, literally means the head of the year. So it's sort of like the Jewish New Year is how people commonly, commonly refer to it, but it's not celebrated like New Year's Eve at all. New Year's Eve is kind of a silly and fun uh, celebration. Uh, the Jewish community is going to be celebrating in synagogue. It's a day of reflection, a day of prayer. The shofar, which is from a ram's horn, sort of sounds like a trumpet, is blown a hundred times each day, um, as long as it's not also uh, the Sabbath. And you know, it is sort of a little bit like New Year's Eve. In fact, we do have kind of the similar idea of resolutions, which means you think back on the past year, you think back to the future, how you can make things better, how can you can um, maybe make up for your mistakes. I think it's a great time for people if uh, they have what we call in the Jewish community, broigus, meaning you're not talking to somebody. It's a great time to shake their hand and make up and uh, focus on doing better for the coming year. So I'm going to say Lashana Tova Tikatev Tikatehem, which means may be inscribed and sealed for a good year. Shana Tova, everybody who's celebrating. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Two weeks ago, I met with several Hamiltonians for, from the 15 in Fairness campaign. The campaign is asking for employment and labour law changes to better protect workers, particularly those in precarious employment. The nature of the work is changing, Speaker. The labour market is evolving. Employment is being transformed. But for too many people, it is not a change for the better. People are working more than full-time hours in two or more part-time jobs and are trapped in a constant struggle, always waiting to be called for a shift, waiting for the next day's schedule, unable to build a better future for their kids, unable to even think about retirement. And more often than not, they are working for a minimum wage, and in, which entrenches them in poverty instead of giving them the chance to provide for their families and themselves. On Saturday, the minimum wage in Ontario will increase by 15 cents. Speaker, that's a small step to keep up with inflation. Speaker, but it is not enough to make a real difference to the lives of workers on the minimum wage. It's time for Ontario to make sure that no one working full-time is stuck living below the poverty level. 15 cents an hour won't cut it. It's time for a $15 minimum wage in Ontario. Thank you to the 15 and Fairness campaigners for your advocacy, and the NDP caucus supports your call for $15 an hour minimum wage. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the TDSB has been considering for some time the sale of Silver Creek School in my community in Etobicoke Centre. And this is very concerning as Silver Creek is leased to two organizations, the Etobicoke Children's Centre and Silver Creek Preschool, both of which provide services to children with special needs. The property also includes green space that is important to our community. As MPP for Etobicoke Centre, I have done everything I can to protect these critical services for our most vulnerable children and to protect the surrounding green space, and been working with members of our community like the Friends of Silver Creek, Etobicoke Children's Centre, and Silver Creek Preschool. I've spoken in our community, in this legislature, met with several ministers of our government and TDSB representatives to advocate for the protection of these services. Most importantly, I've been working with our ministers and staff to ensure that the provincial government does everything possible. 
This has led to a number of important steps. First, in the spring, the government of Ontario wrote to the TDSB to express initial interest in the property. Shortly afterwards, the province committed to the protection of the services in the community, and shortly after that, the province launched discussions with the TDSB on the future ownership of the property. Our community and I have also advocated with city officials to protect the green space, and unfortunately the city indicated recently that it won't be investing to protect the green space. I didn't give up my advocacy there, Mr. Speaker, and two weeks ago at Silver Creek Preschool, I was pleased to announce that my efforts have led to the Government of Ontario deciding to focus only on whole site solutions. In other words, the province will not be considering solutions that involve severing the property or the green space, which is excellent news for our community. I rise today, Speaker, to thank my community for their passion and dedication to this cause and assure them that I will continue to do everything I can to protect Silver Creek and these essential services in our community of Etobicoke Centre. Thank, thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> I thank all members for their statements.